Hi, everybody. Welcome to our last final day of Radikia week as part of the winter vegetable sagra. Um, hopefully you've been able to tune in during this week on YouTube or you're watching it right now. If you haven't um, watched all the videos, you can watch them on YouTube as well as all the ones from Garlic Week. Um, excited to have today with us uh, Linda uh, Fenstermaker, who is a sales rep from Osborne Quality Seeds that sells a lot of radicchio. And we have farmers Gianna and Matthew from the Crows Farm up in Washington, in Bow, Washington, in the Skagit Valley. Um, we are going to watch a video that Linda made of the Osborne seed um, tri variety trial, specifically looking at the late season varieties. Um, and then we'll get back together and ask questions to Linda and Gianna and Matthew. For those of you guys watching uh, on YouTube, you can chat in the box your questions and I will ask them to Linda, Gianna and Matthew after we watch the video. Thanks, see you soon. Hi, I'm Linda Fenstermaker. I'm with Osborne Quality Seeds. I'm the West Coast and Mountain Area Sales Rep. And I'm also the um, go-to radicchio expert. <laughs> um, and we're here at our trial field for this year. Um, and we are gonna go through some of our late season varieties um, that come off around this time, November, December, um, that you can sell in those months and then also store in your cooler through winter. We have over 50 different varieties in this trial um, and we have checks from the lineup that we have in our catalog uh, against some new options from different vendors that we haven't worked with before. Uh, and we also have a range of OP varieties and hybrid varieties. There's just a little bit more range with the OPs. Uh, and then the hybrids are gonna have better yields and better uniformity. So for late season growing, the hybrids can be a really nice option because you can go through your field all at once and harvest everything and store it. Whereas the OPs, sometimes you have to come back and, for back and come again um, to harvest everything. So you, with hybrids, you get a little bit more all in one pick which is nice for storage. The late season varieties that we have generally range from about 110 days to 145 days to maturity. So you can plant them at the same time as your early fall varieties in late June or around the summer solstice. Um, and they will come off and be ready to harvest later in the year. So you, you can build into your planting schedule a succession without actually changing your planting dates just by having different a range of days of maturity with the varieties that you're you're growing on our website under growing information we have a good amount of materials that kind of describe different slotting options and the different types of radicchio so if you're new to growing radicchio that can be a really nice resource for you um, as well as our uh, chart in our catalog has a nice breakdown of the days of maturity and the slots. So you can kind of learn about that. And it also has, in our new catalog, we have a symbol for storage. So you can see which ones we recommend for better storability. Another growing tip for late season um, radicchio growing is to treat it like a cabbage where when it's ready, when the head is of the desired size and density, to just go ahead and harvest it. Because in a field, as you can see, here is pretty wet <laughs> um, so the radicchio is continu going to continue to to take up moisture and um, it won't bolt per se but you could get splitting or you could get more rotting and you can also get more of an elongated core whereas if you harvest it and store it in your cooler you can peel back the layers that kind of decompose in the cooler and have a really nice head that's still at optimal harvest, at its optimal harvest point. So 
that's kind of a good rule of thumb um, just to have more high quality radicchio. This is Rubro, which is the latest maturing Kyoja type that we have in our catalog. It's a hybrid, which is nice. So you can get, um, it, they all kind of come on at once. So you can harvest all of them and store them and they store very well. And these are at 145 days. So for us, they're not quite ready. Um, we seed it in late June. So they uh, need a little bit more time, but there are a few heads that are getting to be a nice size. So these are just very uniform, nice classic flavor and a really classic look with the wide, uh, oops, classic look with the wide ri white rib and the nice bright red deep um, leaves. <clears throat> so this one is a good recommendation for people that want to just harvest a bunch and store it and um, sell out of their storage. One of our most popular late season varieties is Rosalba, which is the specialty pink variety that um, has become very popular. Nice pink color um, in once it gets cold. So generally with late season radicchio, 25 degrees Fahrenheit is kind of your, um, your benchmark. So if temperatures go below 25, you might consider putting Rime or some sort of protection, or if the heads are big enough to harvest them. Um, if the, the later season varieties are bred to have bigger frames and more protection of leaves, so they do handle the cold better than your earlier varieties, but sometimes below 25 and into the teens gets pretty cold for radicchio. So as you can see, the Rosalba is still maturing up. This is a small head and it's still forming, but um, it's starting to get that nice coloration and the leaves are starting to come curl in on itself. Um, so this is a really nice one and some people do harvest it smaller and and um, put it into salad mixes for that bright color or harvest the full heads and do mixed cases with other late season types so it's a pretty versatile radicchio and that color just everyone is so um, attracted to that it's a really nice one for um, the winter when there's not very many nice bright colorful leaf options this is Colonia Tardiva. It's a late maturing Verona type. Um, Veronas are tighter and smaller and a little more pointed than a Kyoja with um, similar red leaves uh, and the white ribs. So this one is days of maturity are about uh, 110 days. So it's a little bit earlier than Rosalba and some of the later ones but it's a nice one to either uh, grow in the late fall and then harvest for winter storage or um, leave in the field for a little bit and harvest out of the field. Good. Just peeling back the kind of rotted outer layers. And there's a nice little head. This is Lucrezia. It's a later maturing for late fall, early winter, Castelfranco type. We have it listed as 110 days to maturity. So it's not quite your very late season varieties and it doesn't store as well as some of the later days to maturity ones, but it's a nice one for harvesting in late fall and early winter. Um, as you can see, there's a little bit of um, some mill or there's a little bit of leaf damage on the outer leaves, but the inner leaves are looking really nice still. So it has the classic speckling and a nice floretted look. Um, this one's still a little bit small.
Here's a nice heavier one. So it has nice speckling in the leaves. And the very nice internal coloration with the light, light kind of buttery yellow and the pink speckles. This is Costa Rosa, which is a specialty Verona type. Um, this is a smaller one, um, but it's still filling in a little bit. Uh, it's really late to mature in 130 days. So it's good for your later season harvest and also stores fairly well. It's, rare, it's very specialty because it has the pretty pink ribbing. Um, and as you can see, that goes all the way through. So it's really beautiful ribbing. Um, and this one does have some off types. So sometimes the leaves are a little more variegated. Um, it's an OP, so it, it tends to have a little bit more off types, but it's a very specialty variety. So it's, it, it's um, just has beautiful coloration. Another option for late season radicchio is growing the forcing types. So we have um, a couple in our catalog that are ones that you grow in the field and as they're starting to kind of fall, the leaves start falling and dying back, then you dig them with the roots and store them in a dark, cool place and they will force. So by taking away the light, it causes this kind of new growth to start that on these types are um, a curling inwards and the white of the stems get really bright and vibrant. So it's another option for doing the late season where you force indoors. The two forcing varieties that we have is Sile Tardivo and Sile Precoce. Sile Precoce is slightly earlier days maturity and the Sile Tardivo are later. So you can plant both of them at the same time and create kind of a, a succession in your forcing because they'll mature and be ready for forcing at different times. There's a lot of really interesting uh, information online about forcing that uh, by Italian farmers and uh, it's a very common practice in Italy so there's a lot of information out there on forcing uh, by the Italian experts. We have the most extensive array of radicchio seed available in the US and we work hard to trial every year and to find seeds that work for different slotting and uh, offer you a variety of options and different radicchio types. So be sure to check out our catalog and our website. My contact information is at the end of the video and we look forward to working with you with your radicchio needs. Cool, thanks. That's there. Check out Linda's information there. Um, again, this will be on YouTube recorded later, so you'll be able to check back in there. Hi, Linda. Hi, Gianna and Matthew. <clears throat> um, that was great. So we're being joined with um, by a couple of farmers that Linda works with, uh, Gianna and Matthew of the Crows Farm. Um, and I wonder if you guys could kind of introduce yourselves for a couple minutes and just, we talked about it beforehand, but rather than me saying it, we'd like to hear from you about um, kind of what your farm model is and where you sell, uh, how much radicchio you grow and, and why you grow it maybe, uh, and then uh, where you sell your produce. Sure, yeah, so I'm Gianna and this is Matthew, um, and we own and operate the Crows Farm. Um, we are about eight acre farm this year. Um, we've been expanding every year um, since our first season six years ago. Um, we primarily sell into our local food co-ops um, through the Puget Sound Food Hub, which is a local food hub here in the Skagit Valley um, that reaches 
down to Seattle, the San Juan Islands, and um, also up to Bellingham, kind of the whole I-5 corridor and, and west of that. Um, we also participate in the farm to school programs um, around us, which we're so lucky to have that community. And, um, and we sell into the Viva Farms CSA, which is where we currently lease land from. Um, our farm model, uh, in the summertime, we specialize in herbs, uh, edible flowers, heirloom tomatoes, salad greens, and fennel. And um, when we get into early, uh, late summer, early fall is when we start seeing our, our heavier vegetables, um, some brassicas like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbages, winter squash, radicchio, and fennel. We love, um, yeah, you can talk more about why we are growing lots of radicchio and what you like about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so a big part of the reason why we grow a lot of radicchio is to provide food in some of these harder months um, to get local food. Um, so we do salad mixes and lettuces pretty much until mid-September and then uh, maybe October-ish and then the weather usually starts getting bad and a lot of the lettuces just aren't marketable. Um, so that's when radicchio's time to shine. Um, radicchio is an amazing component for salads. Um, I fell in love with growing radicchio um, as I worked um, in an Italian restaurant in Vermont. We had um, a garden, a quarter acre garden that was supplied the restaurant and we grew some radicchio and it was on our menu. So Gianna and I were the managers for that garden and I was also a chef and G was like working in front of the house. Um, so it was um, just really became part of my fascination with food and, uh, you know, growing food and bringing it back to the restaurant and coming up with beautiful dishes. Um, radicchio is just so stunning. And, uh, we moved here six years ago, seven, well, was it eight. eight years ago? Oh my gosh. We've been farming for, this is our sixth season. Um, so every year we've been growing radicchio and um, we've been expanding our selections and we've been trying to widen our offerings, like uh, maybe like later into the season, sorry. So uh, last year we were gr um, still selling radicchio into January, um, which was awesome for us. Um, and this year we're, you know, we were harvesting yesterday morning, a lot of beautiful radicchio. Um, so yeah, I think just a lot of the, um, a lot, I love how variable radicchio is. I love that, you know, I, uh, watching um, Linda's film uh, spoke a lot about kind of the benefits of hybrids and uh, being able to come in in one swoop and having like perfect uniformity, um, which is awesome. And I, we definitely, love that um but a lot of what i like to do is kind of look around and find which ones are maybe the oddballs that have different um coloring or um maybe a you know slightly different shapes or some come that are like uh tight round heads some have like more open faces and loose leaves so kind of just searching through the field um i, lo I just love that process and you kind of get to fold back some of the leaves, um, which, you know, might be at this stage a little rotted and a little decomposing in the field. But once you get to that inner beauty, it's just like unwrapping a present in the field all the time. So, you know, it, it's a good deal for us because like right now we're, we don't have like a tremendous amount of products coming out of our farm. Um, so like in the middle of the summer, that process that I just explained about maybe like gingerly like walking through our fields and looking for presents. Maybe that doesn't, <laughs> isn't the case in August where we do not have that kind of time. Um, but right now it's, I, I mean, it's, it's, I love it. I, I love doing that. It's a, I think um, the feedback that we get from uh, chefs and folks who are buying radicchio, it seems like it's always a, it's positive reinforcement that like what we're doing, like people, do appreciate it. So there is this like immediate feedback where I don't know, people don't get as, as hype about like a head of romaine. It's not like people are like, are, you know, on Instagram reposting like, oh my gosh, look at this head of romaine. Like it's radicchio has a little bit more of a, a flair to it. Um, so I, that's, I could go on, but I, I probably shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, that, 
Um, it's, I was, while you were talking about that, I was thinking about the Costa Rosa that, that Osborne has this year where, you know, I, you know, I went at the beginning of the year to Levantia seat. I saw it in the field looking just like the picture that, you know, that you guys showed Linda. And it was like, this is what, well, I mean, we only saw small like um, trial plots and it was like, okay, that's what it looks like. And we came back and some people were growing it this year. And I'm like, whoa, it looks like so many, it has, there's a lot of variability, like you said in it, and which I really appreciate and like, you know, but I was like, whoa. And I started asking questions actually to some breeders, like, is this day length? Like some of them are very long, much more elongated and look more like Procoche than, you know, Procoche than like a Verona type. And they yeah. just look the coloration is so different, but I, to me, it is just like a present, right? Where you're like, whoa, like, what's this? I have a whole bed of it in my yard and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see <laughs> what these things look like. Um, what, so what varieties are you guys growing and I guess why, and then are you doing a lot of storage too? So I guess, and, and thinking, I mean, you could tell us all the varieties, like all, all season, but specifically these late season ones, you know, we have a Novik trial just to mention that we work with Linda. It's happening in Oregon as well as it's in happening. Um, they're actually growing it at Evergreen College in um, Washington, but then there's also a group up in British Columbia, which is similar to Novik called Canovi, and they are tri trialing a lot of the varieties from Osborne. Um, uh, it specifically for kind of like this late season where we're trying to see if we can get heads um, that are available to harvest and sell in like, you know, February. Um, but anyway, what are you guys growing? Do you store and like, why do you grow those? Sure. Um, so pretty much what we're harvesting right now is um, 614, um, a TNT variety, um, Kyoja variety. That's um, for the past two weeks, we've been harvesting that. Um, we generally don't necessarily store do like long-term storage for a lot of our radicchios. Um, what we've been doing is kind of uh, like, like a bulk harvest usually that's um, harvested for about two, you know, stores for about two weeks for us. Um, so we just kind of fill a bin up and uh, usually within a week or two, they are all sold out. Um, so we're not really, f haven't done like major long-term, like I would say like past a month would be long-term storage for Kyoja varieties. Um, so we try to keep it in that like two week uh, ballpark. So um, chefs and the other folks at the other end of the, of the chain have um, storage life as well, um, which is important too. Um, but I know they will store for several, several months, three, four months in the refrigerator. Um, if you Peel back a couple layers yeah as long as you're attentive to when they're like kind of linda was talking about they have to be prime in the field to have optimal storage conditions so that was uh 614 um is something we're growing uh we're really interested in doing the rubro next year um, we're definitely going to be moving into that and then uh we're doing botiglione which is um a treveso variety um kind of coupled with the baldo um which i believe both of those are tnt mm -hmm. and uh so those are the late varieties um our baldos are pretty much done it's uh maybe three weeks ago and then we've been harvesting botiglione um and then for some of our um more obscure ones we are doing the costa rosa we're doing um Rosalba, we're doing a couple of uh, varieties, uh, trial varieties from Levantia. I think it's uh, Monta, Monta Rosa. Rosa and Verosa, which are two pink varieties that uh, we're trialing. And uh, Marianata Kyojo, which is a Veragato um, Kyojo variety that has that creamy color, but a round shape to it. And then we're doing some forcing varieties as well that were um, experimenting with um, the past couple of years, we've had success doing field forcing here where um, we didn't need to bring them into a dark area. We can just field force. Um, so I think that's most of our late varieties that we're focusing on. Um, yeah. Did I miss okay. anything? Oh, Castle Franco's too. Yeah. So we have, um, we have a couple of, yeah, Lucrezia, what other ones do we have? Uh, Cecilia, I think is a, oh, 
is a late variety from Levantia that we are, have been loving for the past couple of weeks. Um, so, oh my gosh, we grow so many and that's just our, our late varieties. Uh, let's not talk about our September varieties that are done. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, I had a question for Linda. Someone asked, when was the video uh, recorded here? I said about 10 days ago, but I can't really remember. It was recorded November 19th. Okay. So that's why some of them are a little bit small still. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we I was just out at the trial field yesterday and um, they all have filled in and we were doing evaluations on some of those later ones. Um, the pinks still aren't quite ready in our field. We um, seeded a little bit later, like in the first week of July and then transplanted out um, towards the end of July. So the pink ones are a little bit behind, but they're turning pink and looking nice, but they're still, we still haven't evaluated those ones yet. Yeah. You know, you, when you were standing out there, you start talking about cold, right? But you just start talking about radicchio in general, like 25 degrees being like the spot where it's like getting into the danger zone. Do you, and I have heard from some farmers that they feel like the pink is pretty susceptible to cold. I guess that's one question I had is like, what are, is that one pretty susceptible to cold? Um, you have specifically the Rose Alba, right? Yeah. Then is, and then also like, what are the most cold tolerant types or varieties? Yeah. So in general, the later maturing ones are going to be the cold hardiest. So like with the ones that Matt and Gianna grow, um, the 614 is like 130 days. So that's really cold hardy, but then the Rubro is 145. So it's even more. Um, and it kind of depends on the, the head protection. So like I said, in the video, the later maturing ones are going to have more bulk to them to protect the heads. Um, an exception is some of the specialty ones like Rosalba that it has a lot of leaf protection and a bigger habit, but it's, the plant habit, I guess, is more open. Mm -hmm. So it does kind of get some um, edge, you know, decomposing a little bit and isn't quite as um, protected, but it is pretty winter hardy. Um, in the catalog, we did put little snowflake symbols this year. So those are the ones that are gonna have better cold hardiness. Um, but yeah, something like Rosalba, it's mainly just that it gets some edge decomposition. Um, so you might just have to peel it back a little bit more or if it's getting into the teens, then definitely covering it with Rime or something like that. Yeah, here's the new Osborne catalog. It just arrived yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so I was excited to see it. I, ha I have a question about it, if you don't mind me asking about something that's not late season, but you guys added Caravaggio, which is a hybrid, and Galileo, which are hybrids. One is the first one, Caravaggio is the Treviso Precoce, and then the Galileo is Amusia. The They're both like the same days to maturity and days, days slot, like, and slot as others that you have. Like, mm -hmm. can you tell me why you guys like added those two specific? The other one was Costa Rosa, which is obviously that's completely unique. And yeah. We, you must have it. So. Yeah. So in order to appeal to a, a wide range of farmers that we work with, we're trying to bring in more hybrids for people that do want a little more consistency. Um, a lot of the people we work with are like what Matthew was saying that um, they like the variegation and like the variety that the OPs offer, but um, we're, we've been trialing a lot of the Bijou seed material and they do really nice hybrid radicchio. Um, so we're starting to, to offer more of those options for people that are doing more wholesale and need a little more consistency um, or are wanting like grow on a super small scale and need more yield out of their um, beds because they just don't have very much space. So um, just having different options. And, and that's kind of our mentality across our whole catalog is offering a little bit of everything for different growers needs. Um, so, and the Galileo is kind of a, it's not a true Lucia, it's a little tighter. Um, so it's kind of in between a variegated Kyoja and a Lucia. Um, 
but it's a really nice heavily speckled like the amount of pink in it is really amazing and it just forms these nice small heads that are you know very uniform and a nice option so cool um and these are all your varieties are from Bejo, TNT, and Levantia. Are that is that all the breeder companies? Yes, okay. currently, yeah. Cool. So um, in that trial, we had a lot of material from Levantia, um, ag and against some of the ones that we have from TNT in the catalog, as well as Bejo too. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we found um, the six fourteens have uh, this is kind of just a side note have been like a really excellent yield for us more so like I'm it looks like our late varieties are they do have more consistency and like a better yield than what maybe like the earlier varieties when they're trying to head in um like September late September when it's still kind of longer daylight um and maybe a heat wave I think we may, maybe we're in the 80s in September this year um which was the first time we saw that um, for our growing conditions. So we had a lot of um, variability um, and maybe some bolting, but we probably had almost like a 90% yield rate um, out of our 614 um, crop in this past couple of weeks. And the biggest problem we've had was is vole damage. Um, there's voles that are um, tunneling underneath uh, the ground and then eating the heart of the radicchio um, so we go to harvest and it's like a hollow head and then the inside is like yeah. shoot out. So that's kind of, that's been our biggest um, downfall with like our late variety radicchio it's, is because of voles, which is the first time we've seen that. And um, following along with some of your, um, some of your comrades in Italy, I've noticed that they're having similar problems there that uh, voles love radicchio. <laughs> like, I'm like, these voles are like eating a half a pound of radicchio. This is wild. Happening. But. Big problem for a lot of farmers down here. I mean, we've been doing these radicchio okay. trials not very well, but <laughs> but from like for like I don't know at least ten years. And I remember at the beginning that being like the very first thing is like so many farmers having trouble with with any kind of like underground rodent. I thought we could do like a good trial to see which ones are more susceptible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> even grow it because of that you know so yeah, um, yeah it's tricky if you have like a smaller plot and you only have maybe yeah. four radicchio heads to work with and then 10 of them get eaten throughout the year it's that's yeah. rough yeah mm -hmm. um okay someone is asking um how you're doing your two-week storage in the refrigerator or not yes in yes. the walk-in cooler yeah okay yep. and, can you explain your field forcing? It's super trial basis, um, but essentially we've been um, getting seed from, uh, was it Franchi for the past couple of years um, for the Tardivo varieties, just because um, a lot of like Osborne, I think this was the first year that Osborne carried it. So a lot of it was just very variable. Um, and mostly harvested in January and not, not even close to what they're doing in Italy. Like not, it's not the same product whatsoever. Um, but for us, it's, uh, it is beautiful. It curls as long as it has that white, the white ribs, I pull it out of the field. Um, and it's <clears throat> for us, maybe a little bit more economical to do it that way, because I don't think we could charge what, we would need to charge to like go through the process of forcing. Um, so we're trying to find this balance of like getting like food to people, like that cool food to people, but not at like $5 a head price point that maybe what it would take to actually go through all the steps. Although we are going to um, try some forcing this week, <laughs> especially since you folks did the, the show yesterday about it. We're like hopped up on it and ready to go and have everything sanitized and we're going to move uh, some into a forcing area. So I'm going to see yeah, how it we, goes. We had a conversation of like, how does anybody make money yeah. <laughs> forcing the video? So if you haven't watched it, you might want to watch it just to hear what other, what people are charging. And it's interesting to hear what we're charging here versus what they charge in Italy. Um, but 
And, but everybody has the same issue, obviously. Like we have to get to a certain scale and have to have that type of demand to be able to, you know. But with that being said, someone does ask, Cassie from uh, Chicory Week asks, um, are you increasing your radicchio acreage? Is it becoming more popular with your accounts? And is it a good money maker for you in general? Um, yeah, I think this year we're at one acre of radicchio. Um, out of our eight acres. So I think that's a pretty substantial percentage. And we have been increasing. Um, yeah. And demand has for sure been increasing um, just from two years ago. Uh, it's people are definitely getting more. I mean, there's just more talk about it, more um, excitement with it. And uh, maybe just that, yeah, that this, things like this is what's what's needed for people to kind of get um, more familiar with the product and, and how amazing it is to be eating, you know, fresh salads um, without having to rely on Arizona and California lettuces. Um, so, yeah, yeah. And that in terms like for economically for us, um, as long as we get our yields right, it becomes it's a it's a good crop for farmers to have. Um, um, but some of those OPs like in September, when you kind of look at your field and you're like, oh, man, we might have only had like a 60 percent yield rate out of this field. Um, you have to really start kind of being careful. Um, at that scale of how much um, product that you're planting and, and actually pulling out of the field. So that's where Linda's uh, talking about those hybrids come really important for, for growers and the economics of radicchio. Um, but yeah, I mean, for sure, it's a, it's a good one for us. It's a good pace um, to kind of just like a, kind of what I referred to and how August is just really busy for most farms. Um, it's nice to have something coming out of the field right now and not only coming out of the field, but then that's income for our farm, which is super important. And um, it's able for us to keep some, uh, some of our crew on a little bit longer into the season, which a lot of people want. People don't want like a three month farm job um, usually. Um, so yeah, it is a, it's a great crop for us. Um, it stores well. And then I just love how we're kind of in this uh, region of the country where it does grow well for us. And we are like, I just, to me, it's like, we're fortunate and we should um, take advantage of that. And, and I think the local community kind of also sees that as like a positive that maybe in Florida, you're not gonna be able to grow Rosaba, you know? So let's, you know, let's get excited about what we can grow and kind of that same idea as what the Italians do with their sagras of each town has like, you know, maybe a cheese that they're come out of the caves and they all have a parade because of it. And I feel like, Radicchio does deserve that um, attention, <laughs> obviously, but yeah. Yeah, there's two things that I wanna add. Well, one, thanks for mentioning that this uh, area is the place to grow it uh, because Siri uh, Ayrton Brown of Local Roots is on here and I'm watching because we have a question for Linda in a second from her, but she always says like, this is the Veneto of North America. So it's like, this is the place, you know? Um, but also Gianna, you said like, you said it's definitely increased in the past two years. So I guess I wonder why you said two years instead of like five years. Is it because you've only been growing, you know, radicchio for two years? Is it because you think it has something to do, like we did start doing the, the Sagra um, and it's very close to you in, in um, Seattle? Like what, I didn't know why you said specifically two years. Yeah, you know, I looked at the, the, the posters behind me and remembered that the Sagra started about two years ago. And, and yeah, we started growing radicchio our first year, but, you know, kind of out of slot and it was very experimental. I mean, the whole farming for us was new. And um, so not only like our experience has developed and um, within the last few years, but in the last two years specifically is when we started kind of trying out these late later season varieties, um, you know, other varieties besides Kyoja and Treviso and um, so I think with our experience, the demand, that's when we've seen the demand. I'm sure it's been probably maybe a little longer than that, but I think the Sagra has a lot to do with it. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I think it has a lot to do with just, um, you know, education and, and telling people how to eat it and, and 
yeah, what's good about it. And um, I know there's one chef that I know who said he really doesn't love radicchio and he said he um, wouldn't, what did he say? He, would, he put it in like a, he wouldn't eat it unless he put it in a simple syrup. So like a sugary water mixture, he would like want to coat it in a sugary water and then it would be palatable to him. But I think with uh, more awareness, it's like, well, come back in November and try this radicchio. I, I almost would put it against a butter lettuce in the middle of like a heat wave in August and tell me which one you think is more bitter, you know? Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, about like the culture around coffee and, and chocolate, it's like an IPA drinking. It's like, oh, we, we, we do like, like bitter. bitter. <laughs> Let's kind of, you know, get your favorite uh, dressing on there and you'll love it. Um, it's a different product um, now than what it is in middle of summer coming from maybe not locally. Mm -hmm. Cool. I like bitter things, but I just do not like IPAs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's just painful to drink them I feel like anyway that's another okay Linda so Siri is asking um is Osborne going to leave all the varieties in the field all winter to look at this winter survivability for late winter being March and uh, I'm sorry uh February March harvest yeah we generally do um and we kind of just keep looking out at it every couple of weeks throughout the winter um this year, the trial is at, at Viva Farms at Boldly Grown's farm. Um, so it, it kind of depends on what their field plan is, but um, we generally do leave it out there till March or so and see how things look. Do you guys have a blog still like uh, where you can, people can go on and look at the write-up and, um, and see photos of them in the field? Yeah, so we just launched a new blog website that you can, um, I, there's a tab on our main website that you can link to it. I think it's osbornseedblog.com. Um, and it, is, it has all of our new blog posts. Um, we used to do a couple of years ago, um, more kind of regular trial results blogs. And we did a few different check-in ones this summer with the trials. Um, I also did a bunch of videos kind of like this one for different trials that we did throughout the year. So we have a YouTube channel too that we'll be posting those for the next couple of weeks. So um, yeah, we always, we try to um, do marketing and things around our trials since especially for growers in the Pacific Northwest and can be really useful. And your customers are the, uh you guys, what's the breakdown like of gardeners versus like commercial growers? And are they more small, medium scale than large scale growers? Yeah, our generally our like average size customer is um, like six to 10 acres. Um, we have work with a lot of people that are smaller and people that are larger, but definitely um, commercial, small scale to medium scale commercial farmers. Um, Home gardeners do buy from us, but our minimums are a little bit higher than some home gardeners. So like for radicchio, for example, we go down to a hundred seeds on some, but mainly it's like 250 seeds. So for a home gardener, that's kind of a lot. Um, but yeah, that's kind of our, our makeup. Right. And you guys have this chart, right? This chart is like the, um, in your catalog and you can have online, the minimums yeah um, different ones yeah because i was looking up i feel like people are going to be asking me about costa rosa um, oh yeah there's 250 is the minimum um one cool thing i got to do this year was work with log house plants which is a nursery a wholesale nursery and like choose some like varieties that i was like oh yeah these are the ones that i think that you should should grow that we've seen in our, you know, in our work and our trials with Novik and other and even vegetables and other projects. And they grew, I think she would have chosen some of those anyway, but I, you know, chose these um, particular varieties. And then, so they're transplants. And then there's like nurseries that are in, I'm in Portland and at least some of those, I know exactly like what they'll have in stock. And then I can like tell people, cause a lot of, I think that a lot of you know, home gardeners are really uh, apprehensive about growing anything that they can't just direct seed, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, speaking of that, we were talking about it yesterday with the forcing and Jason was talking, made the point, and I don't even think about direct seeding radicchio anymore because I'm so used to farmers not doing that at all. Um, but I mean, that is something that gardeners could do is just go ahead and direct seed these, right? Or no? Yeah. Just did. <laughs> um, like, yeah. I, I just wonder, and I know that like some, of, I, there's a couple of farms that I work with that actually were quite big proponents of direct seeding thing, but I'm just wondering if, if for gardeners, when I talk to gardeners, should it, should I, if they can't find plants, is it, would they do okay with direct seeding it, you think? Um, I kind of tend to say that you'll be more successful with transplants, especially home gardeners that have a lot of slugs or, you know, rodents that eat their little starts as they're coming up. So having something that has a little more vegetation on it can help, um, but it's worth trying, you know? Okay. Yeah. No. Do you guys have any experience with direct seeding radicchio at all? No, I mean, a lot of our experience um, is that radicchio is a little bit hard to germinate. I mean, it, it, we might have 85% germination rate on some of our flats. So we have to pay like very close attention to our starts, especially because we're starting them in the heat of this, like the main part of the summer. Um, so it's it's hard to, it's kind of a challenge. It's one of the challenges of radicchio for us is to getting really good starts. So I would assume that that would translate into direct seeding. I think you might have poor germination rates and then um, in a garden that might not, if you have like a 10 foot patch and mm -hmm. say only six out of your 10 come up, you're gonna be maybe disappointed with, uh, you're not utilizing your space as well as you could be. So I think that might be the one concern I would have with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, uh, Siri made the comment saying that some Italian farmers direct so I just, I'm thinking a lot about like Anthony Boutard and Carol at Ayers Creek were always like super big proponents of direct seeding, basically everything. Um, and I did work with some farmers that did it when we were doing trials and, and winter squash as well. And I just wasn't sure if the reason mostly was like the cost of seed can be so high, especially hybrid seed. I mean, this is why people started doing this with sweet corn is we were having a trial that was specifically like, let's try to find sweet corn that we can direct seed and grow and grow successfully instead of the transplanting because the transplanting adds so much work. But then when we were talking to farmers, it was mostly like the cost of the seed that had made it so that they didn't want to direct seed anymore. Mm -hmm. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's one other question that um, I'll ask for the farmers, and I don't know if you said this in the fuel forcing, but did you, did you cover it with we may or anything special? No. No, okay. There's no. not much of a technique with field forcing, where it's just kind of. <laughs> let it grow out there. Yeah, you yeah. just kind of let it be and, and uh, yeah. yeah. I have heard, oh, I have heard of some people with the, the um, forcing, like they, when the leaves start falling back, they can like mm -hmm. tie it up. So that does kind of block a little more light, but it is a little more labor intensive. But Yeah, that was one thing I was wondering. I was texting actually with Brian from Uprising yesterday about that because I've seen that with other things. Like I've seen that with in Cardoon in Italy, like they'll, they tie it up to blanch it and sometimes right. they put like, um, like newspaper around it and tie it up. Um, hmm. It. And I was wondering if anybody did that. I know that, again, like the Boutards uh, at Ayers Creek Farm that had their arch cape, which is like a field forced variety that they've been doing selections on. <clears throat> they don't do anything. They just leave it out and they just leave it out in the field and don't tie it up. But I was wondering if anybody did that. Mm -hmm. We visited a big uh, Tardivo farm in Italy a couple of years ago, and it looked like they were prepared to remay their Tardivo if they had to. They were um, if most likely if that, if the temperature dipped around those, that 20 degree mark, I'm sure they would even cover their Tardivo. So it seems like that was one of the biggest producers in Italy that we were fortunate enough to check out their operation. Um, so they were definitely ready to, um, pull a cover over it. Um, 
just because they're, you know, huge market for it and they have like, that like IGP stamp where it has to be perfect right. where uh, here, nobody has that like quite high demand yet. So thank God. <laughs> <laughs> um, Linda, someone is asking if you have any germination tips. Um, I think just making sure the soil has good moisture, not too much, but not too little, especially because generally in the Northwest and in other Northern areas, you're seeding around the summer solstice where it is starting to warm up. I think just keeping an eye on soil moisture can help. Mm -hmm. Um, and similarly with lettuces, summer germination can be a little harder. So just kind of um, trying to keep your greenhouses a little open because it, it does do better germinating in cooler temperatures. Um, I've got a question about planting dates. It came up yesterday when um, all the farmers were on the call and we were talking about forcing and I was like, oh, I have some radicchio at my yard. I'm going to bring it in. I'll sit, see if I can force it in the basement. I'll set something up, right? Um, and then Andrea from Smarties, which is another company, um, in Italy said, well, you just want to make sure he's like, the most important thing is you just really want to make sure that you have got the right, you transplanted it on the right date. And so I said, I transplanted, transplanted it in mid August. And he said, well, okay, but that might be a little bit on the late side, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is, I think the ones that I had were seeded in mid July and, um, planted in mid August. And now this, this is the issue that I feel like is just like talked about the most always. And this is what, why everything that we did for radicchio for a long time and all these trials for like 10 years ago and whatnot, were just a disaster. As far as like, I mean, you know what any of these things were supposed to look like, we never had them. We were planting like, you know, Castle Franco next to, you know, Treviso Procoche and, you know, like it was all a mess. We didn't know what we were doing at all, but like figuring out the slotting, it was really, really confusing. And then I did go visit TNT in 2014. And then they showed me like, here's, oh, here's the dates that we use. And it was like a different variety for every like 10 days of planting. Yeah. Oh, well, that is a problem. And it seems like they had different planting dates too. For, like for Italy, they had it in three different latitudes. And so, you know, when you're talking about, I mean, and I, all the other farmers that were on the phone yesterday, on, on the, whatever, this Zoom <laughs> yesterday <clears throat> that were in, in your area, they, they seeded, like you said, on the solstice, they seeded and then transplanted a month later. Well, I'm essentially like a month after a little, I was a little bit, I was about three weeks later. Like, do you guys have, I think I remember like a brochure that you guys put together, um, Linda, or do you have recommendations for that? Because that I think like is like very tricky for people yeah. new to like figure out what to, how to see. Yeah, it. um, it's important to remember that that uh, radicchio is day length sensitive. So you kind of have to adjust based on if you're in a long day or short day region. Um, so I suggest kind of, we have the chart in our catalog has you probably can't really see it, but it does have the slotting for like what time of year you'd be harvesting it. Um, and then it also has days to maturity. So thinking about the earlier days to maturity is your kind of earlier ones and the later ones for late growing. Um, and also just thinking about that if you seed too early and they're growing too big when it's warm that they can bolt and then if you seed too late they won't put on enough growth before it starts getting cold so they won't do as well so I suggest kind of trialing in your area trialing a couple different ones and different slottings um, because even people in California if you're on the coast it is cooler weather versus in the valley, it's warmer. So yeah, just kind of trialing in your different regions, um, but using those days to maturity and your latitudes as kind of a benchmark. Mm -hmm. uh, and this might be, 
might be like the same type of question, but, and I, people that are watching this have heard me say this already, but I remember the first time being in Italy and being on the field and with TNT and there was, we we're looking at a Kyoja field and they cut the head and they handed it to me and put it in my hand. And it was like, I had never felt a head of, of Kyoja like that before because it was, it felt like cabbage in my hand. Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, like, cause we were not doing a good job here <laughs> in our trials and they were, they were not very dense. Um, and so like, what, what's going on there? And, uh, you know, how do we make sure that we're getting like these nice dense, you know, head, heavy heads, especially for farmers that are selling by weight, <laughs> um, you know, and rather than these light kind of loose heads. I mean, I find this in my garden all the time, you know, I'm like, oh, here we go with this loose, light head. <laughs> like, yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, if your heads are loose, I would suggest starting them a little bit earlier. Um, also from our trials, the hybrids tend to fill in better. Um, so thinking about that as an option um, and yeah, sometimes they do fill in if you wait longer, but if it's getting to be too cold, that's when starting the seeds earlier can be helpful. Right, right. Yeah, but it is challenging. And that's why a lot of people are like, Rubidicchio is cool, but it's a lot of work to figure out, you know, what works. I mean, but once people figure it out, it seems like they're doing a really great job. Yeah, and definitely. And I think that another really big thing that's happened in the past, at least since I've been trying to, you know, work with BDQ, is that the seed sources have improved drastically. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Osborne and Johnny's and Uprising and other companies that are bringing in like better improved like varieties for us and try and you guys this do so, such extensive trialing it's I mean you told me you have like 150 varieties or something uh this year we have I think like 58 or something okay. yeah. still was, a lot <laughs> good I was like where are they getting all this variety like, yeah. <laughs> so just like that is uh so helpful because you got you mentioned Frankie before and not to like hate on Frankie, but it's like when we were dealing with an, an or, you know, getting like seeds from Italy, like Frankie packages, um, there's so much variability in it. I mean, just like not in, not in a way that it's like, oh, this is cool. Cause there's so much variability. It was like, this is a mess, you know? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, just being able to have access to better seed has been like really like a game changer, I think. And then people, I mean, it seems like all of these farmers, like you guys, that um, have kind of figured it out and go to Italy to like talk to farmers, you know? Um, so, you know, you guys have really put in a lot of work and like figured out the slotting, figured out what varieties work for you. We've got seed companies that are offering a lot better options now. Um, I think it's like really fantastic. And uh, I was gonna wrap up like that. I was starting to wrap up and that wrap up guys because we have one more question. <laughs> um, this is uh, a farmer in from Belgium. And she's been on here many days in a row. Um, she's in Belgium, mild climate because of the Gulf, Spree Gulf Stream, but we're further north than you. What's more determining, day length, like latitude or temperature? Um, if it's mild, then it, if it's a mild climate, then I would say the day length. Okay. Um, but like I was saying, the, I mean, it's just fantastic. It's just, fan, I mean, that you guys are growing radicchio and growing more and more. An eighth of your production is radicchio. You're seeing increased sales. You're passionate about it and sharing that passion. Uh, the same goes for Linda. I mean, you guys, you know, always, everything that we do that's like radicchio, Linda's there <laughs> on board with it. Um, really appreciate all the, the work that you guys are doing to, to bring the video to the people. Yeah. And you too. Yeah, Absolutely. You too. This is inspiring. It, it makes it, you know, keep going round and round, I think. Yeah. <laughs> is there anything that we uh, didn't touch on that you guys want to say before we sign off today? Hmm. No. Yeah, I don't think so. 
we're all gonna go eat radicchio for lunch, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah, wait for lunch. <laughs> Thanks guys so much. Um, this will be recorded on YouTube. You guys wrap up the Radicchio week and we have Collards Week next week. I hope that you guys can tune in then. Yeah. Thanks so much. Oh, thanks.